Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great honor to have the opportunity to introduce uh, three terrific panelists this morning. Before I do that, what I'd like to do is just frame the question that we're here to bring some answers to. The question of this session is what can the Commonwealth do to make it easier to do business across the Commonwealth? And I think it's just worth, before we jump in to the President's keynote, thinking about why this is particularly urgent now to think about the context in which this is happening. A first reason is that Commonwealth countries rank both first and second on the ease of doing business World Bank ranking, the, the latest World Bank ranking, that's New Zealand and Singapore, but also among five of the top reforming countries, that's countries that have moved up the ranking the fastest, are also Commonwealth countries. That's Brunei, Malawi, India, Zambia, and Nigeria. So um, I think that's a first reason for really taking this session seriously. There's some learning that can be done across the Commonwealth on this issue. A second reason is that in all parts of the Commonwealth, regional initiatives are really taking hold. So just two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we saw the African Union meeting in Kigali and signing a comprehensive uh, continental free trade agreement, a great ambition to take forward trade across the continent. In ASEAN, we're seeing similar initiatives, and I'm sure Nazir Razak will, will, will talk a little bit about that on today's panel. And these regional initiatives are going to be really important for business opportunities, not least for the third reason why we need to look at this today, and that's the seismic shift we're seeing, or we're seeing accelerated in global governance, with the United States having been for the last 60 years the absolute leader in holding a multilateral rules-based system. And now we're seeing President Trump accelerate away from that leadership, whether it's on TPP or on NAFTA, on nuclear non-proliferation, on climate change negotiations. Suddenly, the world is presenting new opportunities for leadership on global trade, on global investment, and global relations. So for all those reasons, I think it's very timely for the Commonwealth to convene a discussion on how we can make it easier to do business across the Commonwealth. To address this, let me first invite President Buhari of Nigeria. As you all know, he has had a long and dedicated record of public service. He's leading his country at a very pivotal moment. Nigeria was the one country or the one very important country that at the African Union summit stepped back and said, hold on, let's make sure we bring our population along with us as we sign a free trade agreement, which has a, which has a wisdom to it, which might well prove even more strengthening of the African free trade area in the end. President Buhari, it's a great honor to have you here with us today, and could I invite you to come and make your opening remarks? Thank you. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the invitation to address this Commonwealth Business Forum on the subject of making business easier between Commonwealth countries. I am honored to be in your midst today to share my views on matters related to business, prosperity, and the welfare of our Commonwealth community. This edition of the Commonwealth Business Forum convenes at a historic point in the Commonwealth and at a critical moment in the global economy. So before we share these experiences on how we can make business easier between our countries, it would be appropriate 
to take a look at our Commonwealth and briefly take stock of the state of the global economy and the relationship with our domestic economies. Lessons abound. These lessons are as global as they are domestic, including those of our individual countries. I will therefore share the Nigerian experience. Commonwealth 25 is historic because this is the largest gathering of leaders of the Commonwealth. Here in our Commonwealth, we are endowed by the diversity of 53 nations. We are bound by common values. We are working together to promote a common agenda across a number of areas. The values that bind us are of those of democracy, the rule of law, good governance, peace, and security. We are committed to these values, and we believe that if we adhere to these values, we shall enhance human welfare and condition of the people in the countries where we have been elected to serve. In the global economy, the macroeconomic figures are positive. The numbers show that growth is strengthening. In its most recent estimates, the International Monetary Fund upgraded its global GDP forecast to 3.9% for 2018 and 2019. Trade and investment are driving the current growth momentum. Credit and money supply are easier globally and within countries. Accentuating the uncertainty and anxiety are complex ongoing changes in economic alliances and partnerships and trading relationships. Certainly and predictably are uh, in question. Geopolitical tensions are rising. In developing countries, labor and industry are concerned about distortions in trade policies that result in subsidized products which have contributed to exports dumped in developing economies. These have had effects in the form of job losses. Growth is not yet inclusive and remain elusive. There are downside risks about disruptions to trade and investment. Global and regional markets have been considerably rattled by the risk of trade wars. Concerns over climate change are unabated and are increasing. There are tasks and duties on all sides. I am glad that the 25th Commonwealth is looking to adopt a communique and declaration on Commonwealth connectivity agenda on trade and investment to boost multilateral trade, intra-Commonwealth trade, and economic growth within the Commonwealth. To make business easier amongst countries in the Commonwealth, we must therefore ensure that markets remain open and undistorted. This is why I believe that making business easier in the Commonwealth is a shared responsibility for us all. Nigeria believes that making business easier across the Commonwealth will resolve around a number of issues. Firstly, trade and investment facilitation to generate resources for sustainable development. Two, ease of doing business. Three, regional integration that expands markets with safeguards against injurious trade practices from third parties. Four, more inclusive growth with the 
empowerment of women and youth. Five, providing a platform for small and medium enterprises. Six, a radical expansion of human capital for the 21st century, what is now known as knowledge economy. Hard and software infrastructure for 21st century digital economy to boost e-commerce, increase efficiency, solve developmental problems, and enhance cyber security. The foundation of prosperity and the wealth of nations are rooted in trade and investment, accompanied by constant domestic adaptation to sharpen our comparative advantages by creating an enabling environment for business. This is why the theme of this Commonwealth Business Forum is so important. Nigeria believes that the Commonwealth should be a champion for trade and investment facilitation. In November last year, in Abuja, Nigeria, in partnership with the Economic Community of West African State, convened a high-level trade and investment facilitation forum for development. The Abuja statement from this forum deepening Africa's integration in the global economy through trade and investment facilitation for development has become a global and multilateral reference point. We believe that the Commonwealth should lend its support to these types of activities as a sound model for marketing business easier amongst Commonwealth countries. To underscore Nigeria's commitment to spreading prosperity through the Commonwealth, in the first six months, Nigeria co-chaired with the United Kingdom, the UK All-Party Parliamentary Group for Trade Out of Poverty. The report of this Commonwealth Inquiry report was launched on 3rd April 2018. Nigeria affirms its commitment to the principal message from this Commonwealth Inquiry Group that Nigeria co-chaired with the United Kingdom. The surest, most sustainable way to lift millions of people out of poverty across the Commonwealth is through boosting trade and investment. We believe that we, as leaders in the Commonwealth, should grasp the opportunity and agree to a major new focus on trade and investment for inclusive development. Nigeria organized on the 17th April 2018 a UK-Nigeria Trade and Investment Forum at the London Stock Exchange. I urge the Commonwealth Business Forum to join Nigeria and prospective investors in the Nigerian economy to participate in the forum. The ongoing Nigerian experience to this end is illustrative. An enabling environment for business was and remains one of my priorities as president. We are undertaking deep and extensive ease of doing business reforms. The first stage of these reforms are being staged under a 60-day national action plan. Stage one focuses on eight areas that make it easier to register businesses, obtain construction permits, get credit, pay taxes, have electricity made across borders, facilitate entry and exit of people and register property, excuse me. <coughs> These reforms were coordinated in an executive order. Transparency and efficiency across government was mandated and is made enforceable. These reforms 
have resulted in improvements, reduction in cost and time, and greater transparency, particularly for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Stage two is focused on 11 areas, improving on stage one. This stage also covers new areas, including contract enforcement, simplifying the procurement process, and trading within Nigeria. Action in this and subsequent stages will evolve inter alia around refutational issues. In acknowledgement of efforts underway, Nigeria was moved up 24 places to 145th in the World Bank's ranks of doing business. Report published in November last year, Nigeria was also recognized as one of the top 10 most improved economies in the world. However, we know that there is much more work to be done. We are now, we are now in the next stage. This is work in progress. Nigeria's ease of doing business reforms are vital across structural reforms that will enable our country to attract and retain investment, connect to global value chains, and maximize the benefits of an open rules-based economy. Some of our lessons may be useful for the Commonwealth family. Nigeria's doors are open to business. Nigeria is and shall remain an open trading economy, deepening regional integration governed by the rule of trade law. But if we are to make business easier between our countries and going beyond the Commonwealth, we must avoid trade wars and work if collectively to preserve the global trading order, support regional initiatives, as well as support domestic structural reforms that focus on the priorities of individual countries. In conclusion, Nigeria believes that if we are in a collective Commonwealth commitment to the ease of doing business, we shall spur growth, multiply wealth, and expand employment opportunities. These objectives will be accelerated by trade and investment facilitation. In the current global economic and trade policy landscape, Nigeria believes that the Commonwealth, because of its composition and experience, is uniquely positioned to grasp the opportunity to implement bold measures for trade and investment facilitation, hence making business easier between Commonwealth countries, has the potential to generate much needed resources for sustainable development. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Buhari, for sharing with us a very ambitious agenda that you have for your country, but also for reminding us very compellingly that ease of doing business and trade policy need to be underpinned by sustainable development at home. And I think you've, you've made that, that case both in words today and in your policies, so thank you for that. I'd like to turn now and introduce our other two panelists. Um, I'd like to start with Dato Seri Nazir Razak, the CEO of CIMB uh, Bank in Malaysia, but also a proponent, advocate, commentator on ASEAN and, and a very prominent in the Southeast Asian region on that issue. I guess, Nazir, it would be interesting for this audience to hear, are there things that the Commonwealth countries and their interactions with each other should learn from ASEAN or vice versa? Thank you, uh, Ngari. First of all, um, you know, I've been in business in banking for 30 years 
and when I was asked about thinking about, to think about um, Commonwealth as a business platform, I thought it was a very left field question. Um, essentially, um, it, it hasn't been. Uh, and um, when I think about it, um, you know, to be honest, we look at Commonwealth as an organization that was that's legacy um, of the colonial past. And, um, you know, it, we watch pretty good Commonwealth Games events. Um, but when I reflected on it, actually the question is why not, right? There are 53 countries um, and statistically it's 14% of world GDP. 11 countries of um, uh, the Commonwealth have GDPs of over 100 uh, billion US dollars. Uh, so there's real opportunities to convert this into a more um, a facilitative business platform, right? Um, then if you go to the extreme, the idea of a sort of TPP a la for Commonwealth isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. I think hard wiring amongst 53 countries uh, isn't going to happen. Um, so when I reflect on what ASEAN has done, uh, I would probably make five uh, suggestions uh, for us to consider uh, as a basis of improving Commonwealth as a platform for business. Uh, one is, I think, um, the Commonwealth needs to mean something uh, for businessmen from Commonwealth countries. Uh, and I think I'd point to the APEC card, uh, which many of us carry. Since I um, took on an APEC card, I travel more frequently to APEC countries because it's much easier, right? And because of that, I'm actually prone to do more business with APEC countries. <laughs> Two, I think um, Commonwealth can facilitate uh, greater flow of information. Um, the Secretariat could coordinate better flow information amongst businesses. And here, uh, I think the Secretariat can guide countries uh, in terms of what information is required. And in particular, it's things like the tax relationship between one country and another, uh, which people often forget uh, when they you know, put out their websites, etc. This kind of detail uh, is very important for businesses. Uh, third, I think there's an opportunity for the um, uh, Commonwealth to the Secretariat to become more like a platform organization where you essentially encourage multi-stakeholder groups to come in and talk about how more business can be done amongst each other. The mistake we made at ASEAN was to make it too governmental, intergovernmental. It doesn't work because governments have limited understanding of what businesses need. What you need to do is to draw uh, businesses to come and give suggestions from ground up in terms of what is really uh, required. Uh, fourth, I think there may be an opportunity to, to help uh, with capital flows. Uh, why not uh, create a Commonwealth private equity fund, right? Uh, with the big countries maybe uh, kicking off with some financial commitment uh, so that again, you know, countries have more um, uh, making the whole Commonwealth theme more relevant uh, to businesses uh, across the region. Uh, and fifth, I think uh, the Commonwealth needs to improve in terms of um, developing Commonwealth as a brand. I think Commonwealth needs to stand for something. I think the only thing it stood for is maybe uh, human rights. Um, but I think today, uh, with what Nairi described uh, as you know, the US um, relinquishing its leadership role uh, in terms of free trade, etc., isn't that an opportunity for Commonwealth to stand up uh, for uh, a more open um, um, uh, um, global system? Um, we could also stand up, uh, we could also uh, use Commonwealth to maybe help Commonwealth countries understand the fourth industrial revolution better uh, in line with what the president uh, was mentioning uh, in his speech uh, earlier. So those are five suggestions I could make. Uh, and finally, let me just say, you know, my, my analogy is this. You know, I joined or we joined the Commonwealth Club in 1957. We've been largely ignored since 1957. And since 1957, we've joined a lot of other clubs, right? And we've had a good time in these other clubs. Uh, so if Commonwealth wants to be relevant to us, to businesses today, Commonwealth has its work cut off, right? You really have to put your back into it uh, for Commonwealth to be relevant to businesses uh, today. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I, 
I think that's called powerful stakeholder feedback for the Commonwealth. Um, and five very important suggestions. I'd, I'd like to turn Martin to you. Martin Sutherland is CEO of Delarue. You're CEO of a company whose, whose mission really is to facilitate secure good transactions among countries. How does uh, Nazia's list look to you? What would, or, or let me put it a different way. What would your top one or two priorities for governments be? Governments that actually want to make it easier for other government, for, for companies in other countries to do business in their territory. What yep. would you put at the top of your list? Yeah, sure. Well, maybe I can just step back for a moment and then, mm -hmm. and then I'll get into that. I mean, Dunaroo is uh, a business which has been uh, applying its trade around the world now for over 200 years. Uh, so I think we actually have a much uh, kind of longer and older uh, heritage and history than the Commonwealth itself. Um, so, but the Commonwealth is uh, the most important market in which we operate because of our history and because of the connections that we have with the Commonwealth. Uh, we found it uh, a very welcoming community of countries in which to do trade. It's a fantastic market to operate in. But we don't just see it as a market from into which we export, into which we sell. We see the Commonwealth countries actually as the, the sort of manufacturing base of our, of our business. We have eight manufacturing sites around the world. Seven of the eight are in Commonwealth countries. Uh, and so that then asks, you know, maybe begs the question as to why have we chosen those countries to invest in? Um, why, you know, why have we taken such a long-term view? What do we do as a business? You're right, we're, a, we're fundamentally a security business. We're the largest commu uh, commercial producer of banknotes in the world, so we help uh, the citizens of the world engage and transact in the global economy. Developing economies in the many Commonwealth countries, actually the only means by people by which people can transact is with cash, mm -hmm. cash in their hand. They don't have you know, many of the other fintech options available to them. So we help people kind of transact and engage. We produce identity uh, documents. We help people uh, have an identity recognized by their government. That means that they can get access to public services, they can get access to healthcare, they can get access to education. And we also produce brand protection labels which enables consumers to understand the product they're buying and ensure that it is, that it is um, authentic. And so that is countering illicit trade, which again is a, you know, sort of a terrible blight on the, on the global economy. So that's what we're engaged in. We, we, we manufacture all of those things within Commonwealth countries. And the business model that we've found to be most effective is to localize production. Maybe because, it, because they're security, security documents, many countries want those documents produced within their country or locally within uh, the region. So I say, we don't see it as a market that we export into, we see it as a, a market in which, we, in which we operate and manufacture. And we've been successful in that because uh, we're often encouraged um, to join into you know, joint ventures with, uh, with our governments. If we can see uh, a transparent legal system, a transparent regulatory system, uh, so, it's, so we can understand the environment that we're getting into. Often between Commonwealth countries, Commonwealth countries the legal system and the regulatory system are, are common because of, because of the history of how they got to where they got to. So for us it's about transparency, it's about consistent legal systems, consi consistent regulatory systems, access to skilled labour. We actually have uh, you know, fantastic, as I say, manufacturing facilities across the Commonwealth uh, countries. And for us, it's important that we can actually move some of our staff betwe between those countries. So the free movement of labor between those countries is important to us. Some of our heads of site have grown up through one, one part of our organization, and we move them to a different country, and they can take the skills and the experience across our, uh, across our manufacturing base. So I think I would, I would point to that as well. Can I pick that, that one up, the skilled labor? What is it that business can do, do you think, across the Commonwealth to help ensure that there is a pool of skilled, work-ready labor in countries. It tends to be something left to governments, but is there something that CEOs and business could be doing? Yeah, well, and, and I think the title of the, uh, of the panel is around kind of, well, you know, what's, the, what's the partnership between the, the public and the, and the private sector? How can we work together on that? And that's something, again, that we have successfully done within Commonwealth countries. We as a business, uh, you know, invest in um, apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. uh, we have apprenticeship programs where actually we, we take some of our uh, some of our own colleagues and put them through them, but also we often take uh, some of our customers 
uh, through you know, kind of training programs uh, as well. And so we often find ourselves in a situation where we are jointly investing in, um, in skills and training, training programs with our local host government. And is there anything that you think specifically the Commonwealth should be doing? Mazia gave quite a lot of homework <laughs> to the organization, but is there anything that you think either, not just the Commonwealth heads of government or secretariat, but Commonwealth business, is there anything that you would, would, would put high on the list for, for them to be doing? I think I just come back to uh, having a transparent environment. I think for businesses, mm -hmm. businesses always want to make long-term investments. Some of the, uh, the relationships we've had with Commonwealth countries go back for, uh, for 40 years. Uh, we've had manufacturing facility uh, in Kenya for, for nearly 30 years, in Sri Lanka for 40 years. So you know, we, we are looking for long-term mm -hmm. investment. The only way that a business can be confident about making a long-term investment is around transparency of the, reg of the, you know, the legal environment and the regulatory uh, environment. And um, I mean, a topic that often comes up actually is around you know, kind of ethical trade and ethical business as well. So having clarity on, on, on some of those sorts of issues is also important to us. And so does, sorry, last, last question for me, but does tra transparency include business advising governments, for example, not to clamp down on media, civil society that's whistleblowing on poor systems. You know, how, how far would you take that? Uh, sorry, I, don't I, th I, think, I think it's the opposite of that, actually. I think we would, we would want, uh, we want governments to, you know, to tackle issues like bribery and corruption mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and some of those things so that we can understand that we're, we're operating in a, in a sort of safe and secure mm -hmm. economic environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I might have missed yeah, it. Well, question. I guess it's because the, the ease of doing business survey and rankings you know, one criticism made of them is that they can give a government very high marks for regulatory, for getting the regulation right, even if that government is actually stifling firms, citizens, activists from being critical of the way those rules are being implemented. You know, that, that it's back to what President Buhari was saying about the relationship between getting the rules right but bringing your citizenship along with you to underpin them. Yeah, well, I think the products that we provide to our customers, which are you know, ultimately uh, central banks who buy banknotes or it's into the infrastructure of government around passports and, and so on, um, they are about enabling the citizens of those countries to, to better engage in the economy, as well as say, better kind of have you know, access to government services and so on. So I think philosophically, that's where we come from as a business. Mm -hmm. That's kind of our value set. Sure. So that's what we'd expect from the governments that we, that we work closely with. Good, thank you. Now, what about some suggestions from, from the audience about what the Commonwealth should be doing to, or what Commonwealth businesses should be doing to facilitate um, trade? So I'm gonna take a flurry. So if you could each be nice and brief so we can really crowdsource <laughs> some ideas. Do we have some roving microphones? Um, great, so if you could bring to this gentleman here. Just a very brief comment. I'm going to be rude and stop you after one sentence so that we can collect all those eight comments that are waiting. Yes, uh, I think His Excellency the President uh, set the platform mm -hmm. because we have 53 countries. The only way we can make progress is through regional cooperation. Mm -hmm. And I think the way to do it is what Mr. Nazir has said. I think he has made excellent recommendations. What I'd like to say is this. Mm -hmm. We have commonwealth associations mm -hmm. in most of our countries which mm -hmm. meet once or twice. What we need mm -hmm. are uh, com commonwealth business councils mm -hmm. in every country and also at the regional level. Brilliant. And linked up to the uh, global commonwealth forum. Thank, Thank you. you. So regional commonwealth business councils. Just behind you, sir, if you pass the microphone back. And if you could just identify yourself very briefly. Good afternoon. Roger Latchman from South Africa. Uh, one of the greatest, well, by the way, I must, Mr. Nazir, concur totally with your points that you've raised. One of the greatest impediments that I find is that the visa requirements um, is obviously a huge challenge for doing business across the Commonwealth countries, certainly in the UK. And the other challenge that I had was opening a bank account in the UK for our business. After 18 months, we finally had that resolved, but uh, it was a huge challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. If we can go to the back there. Great. And we're going to work forward from there. Yes, you, sir. Um, my question is for uh, the president of Nigeria, my president. My name is Anthony Okolo, and I'm in the private sector 
um, in Nigeria. And it's specifically towards the Northeast. Uh, while we appreciate the efforts to um, achieve the security that we have, we as a people know that um, the job is not completely done and that we need to provide investments into that area to be able to consolidate those gains. So my question is, what are, is your government doing, uh, Mr. President, to facilitate and ease investments in those areas because our people desperately need it? Thank you. And then just in front, if we can keep the microphone coming forward, the lady. My question to Mr. Nazir or a comment, uh, he rightly said that the, uh, the government should not get involved in the businesses. So is there a possibility that the government can empower the council, as someone mentioned, that there should be councils who be, should be authorized to go ahead and you know, conclude the business or the trade agreements uh, instead of waiting for the governments? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then moving up to the lady in front. Yep. Hi, my name is Bereza Chiang, and I'm in the um, food industry. And yesterday we had uh, brilliant discussions in the agriculture forum. So my question and suggestions is to President Buhari, um, and this is around regulations um, and standards in food and agriculture. I'd love to see a Commonwealth that is enabling all the Commonwealth countries, whether they're in the developing nations or in the developed countries, that would be able to develop new products or create new products that they can trade. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to see an institution that enables a link between R&D, knowledge transfer, and especially learning from what has worked in Europe when it comes to academia, research, and link with the industry, so that we are able to now pilot new initiatives that enable us to trade in the agriculture and the group success. Thank you very much. And the gentleman in front, yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, Your Excellency, President Buhari, um, I've just got a question. How do we make youth empower? My name is Farai from Zimbabwe, from an organization called Youth in Energy. But my, and then the question is, how do we make youth empowerment more practical? Because it seems like in most African countries, it's a tick box exercise uh, that is presented and looks glossy, but on the ground, the youths are not benefiting. Thank you. Great. Look, we've crowdsourced quite a few ideas. OK, one more, just from the very back. Person in the hat at the very back. Oh, yes, sir, you've got the microphone. Take it. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Uh, my name is Chairman Tien, I'm from Cameroon. My question is addressed to His Excellency, President of Nigeria, A mm -hmm. Few weeks behind, Africa was anxiously waiting for the outcome of the continental free trade area. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a shocking wave to me in particular, a trade specialist, to uh, notice that Nigeria, on a Sunday, three days to the commissioning of uh, the foundation for the continental free trade area retracted after negotiating and even vying for the secretariat. So, Mr. Bwari, I wish to know your own stakes now that 44 countries have commissioned to the free trade area without Nigeria. What are your expectations and what is your vision for a common market on the continent? Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'd like to give the panelists a chance to leave you with one takeaway thought from this session. Um, President Buhari, there's great interest in your thoughts on many issues, on investments in the Northeast, on the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, feel free to take your pick, but would you like to take the microphone and, and leave us with, with, with a final thought from you? I think it's probably already turned on. Well, uh, thank you very much for the observations. I will start with one on the North East. Um, uh, all, all the questions, I think, uh, uh, will reflect uh, about uh, Nigeria's preparedness uh, to accept investment and secure the confidence of those who are going to invest or those who are already there. Um, I believe uh, for those who are following us closely, they could recall uh, on the political um, campaign we conducted and uh, the success we scored, 
was based on three things. First, securing the country, and in particular, the person who mentioned the Northeast. The so-called Boko Haram was uh, occupying a large chunk of that part of the country, and they caused a lot of damage to the infrastructure, especially educational and health. And then the economy. We have uh, a very young population. Our population is estimated conservatively to be uh, 180 million. Uh, this is a conservative one. More than 60% of the population is below the age of, six, uh, of 30. Uh, a lot of them haven't been to school, and uh, they are claiming uh, uh, you know that Nigeria has been an oil producing country, therefore uh, they should sit and do nothing and uh, get housing, health care, uh, education free. But let me tell you that um, uh, recently my Minister of Education or for Information was constrained to answer a question when people accuse the administration of doing nothing. He said, let Nigerians be reminded what position we were before May 2015, what condition we are now, and what we have achieved between then and now. And I think people were impressed with the answer. The security, we have done quite well. Um, economy, um, we have done very well, especially in agriculture, by providing soft loans, and the uh, guarantee is just uh, you have to belong to a certain locality and you have got land. You don't have to go to the banks, you know, uh, uh, and bring a physical collateral. So uh, I think a lot is being done. And, um, and on the security side, certainly, uh, both in the northeast and in the south-south, uh, there has been uh, an improvement on the security of the country. And this morning, before just I came here, I saw Shell Group. They came and saw me. They are preparing to invest $15 billion, you know, uh, in, in Nigeria. They came and broke the news to me. So really, uh, we are not doing too badly. And uh, I, I think you should get in touch with your colleagues back at home and tell them to, to, to think very clearly and positively of what this administration is doing. Thank you, President Buhari. You. That's fantastic. <laughs> Nazir Razak, we're out of time, but can you leave the audience with one final thought from you? The one, the one takeaway you'd really like them to do? No, I think if Commonwealth wants to get serious about facilitating business, I think business welcomes it. Mm -hmm. But you really got to get serious. You got to put money behind the secretariat. You got to empower the secretariat. And you've really got to make it easier uh, for us to travel uh, between countries, do business between countries. Uh, and of course, uh, to the gentleman's point earlier, um, make it easier for us to do cross-border banking. Mm -hmm. I know um, in CIMB London, we have this deluge of bank account openings by Malaysians. You know why? Because although they bank with British banks in Malaysia, when they come to UK, they can't. They're not recognized. Yeah, I know there are two British bankers, at least here. Uh, you need to change that. If you're really global bankers, you need to facilitate global banking. Thank you. Martin Sutherland, a final thought. So I think bankers think about the deployment of capital. Mm -hmm. As a manufacturing business, we think about uh, the deployment of people. Mm -hmm. So I think my takeaway would be there are 2.4 billion people uh, within the Commonwealth countries. We need to tap into that resource. We need to put those people to work. It's an amazing resource. It's fantastically skilled. We have successfully tapped into it. And I think actually if, if the governments of the Commonwealth can make that easier and can facilitate uh, access to that talent, then um, that would be a good thing. Thank you. So three big takeaways from, from today. So first, I think the Commonwealth, the message from this room is the Commonwealth needs to engage, whether it's through regional business councils, engaging business, engaging countries that have long felt neglected. So that's, that's number one, engage with business in order to create more ease of doing business. A second is 
just make it easier to transact. We've heard about tax, we've heard about bank accounts, we've heard about visas, about travel. Working on just making those basic um, transactional interactions much easier. And third, I think there's a strong message about where the Commonwealth can help and business in the Commonwealth can help innovate. Innovate on food and agriculture and through research, innovate through private equity and, uh, and, and, and investments across the Commonwealth, and innovate, as Martin ended on, in thinking about how to make people work ready, how to improve the development of people across the Commonwealth, how the Commonwealth can build on, its, on sharing lessons across itself and taking forward new relationships that can strengthen each member of it. So can you join me in thanking President Buhari, Nazir Razak, Martin Sutherland for a terrific discussion and thank you for throwing your ideas in as well. Huge honour to have you chair that session and with His Excellency and the other members of the panel. We're now going to move very quickly into our concluding session, uh, which is a celebration of the amazing sporting event that has just taken place um, in Queensland over the last two weeks. It feels like it's been a bit of a marathon for me, but whenever I've been working until midnight, uh, the Australians seem to be still doing sport and still winning. Um, so we started this conference with three Australians on the stage. We're going to end this conference with another three Australians in the stage. But they lost the netball, um, which is all that matters. Um, <laughs> if you just take, stay in your seats for a second, I'm going to hand over to my chairman, Lord Marland, who's going to formally conclude the session. Before we have a little session chaired by Catherine McGuinness, chairman of the Policy and Resources of the City of London. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, well done. Um, just take your seats for f 15 minutes before we end this show, uh, but well done. This has been an endurance test of two and a half days, which we've uh, just about to complete. Uh, and I want to place on record my thanks to our strategic partners, the City of London, Catherine, Please take messages back to the uh, Lord Mayor and his team of how grateful we are for everything you've done, and particularly you yourself in chairing and being so um, vigorous uh, in your participation. Uh, thanks to the UK government for their support. And um, it uh, is really fitting, as John said, that we should be ending this with a Queensland moment and on the panel we have Cameron Dick, who's become a good friend in the last few days, because I've seen him in swimming costume, well, nearly. He wasn't allowed to reveal his legs. Uh, and Tom Tate, who is mayor of the Gold Coast, uh, really ironically, they're both from separate, different parties, but combined together to put on the most magnificent show. And before that, uh, Mario Panisi, who uh, put on a great event, which was an innovation event, really around life sciences, which is what uh, Queensland is starting to major on as it diversifies its economy from obviously a mining and uh, uh, economy and uh, to other things. And life sciences has become a major issue. Uh, uh, Mario and I have, uh, or not I actually, someone and Mario have put together a memorandum of understanding between Life Sciences Queensland and the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council of how we continue to share uh, this Life Sciences relationship between the rest of the Commonwealth and Queensland. And I'd like, Mario, you to come up and sort of co-sign this now. I'm signing it, but I barely read it. You really appreciate that, Mario. I trust you completely. Thank you very much. Um, but uh, thank awesome. you so much for, uh, for everything you've done, and congratulations on a, thank a you, great Life Sciences uh, event. Thank you, Lord Mullins. It's indeed our honour and pleasure to support the work of Seawick, and I look forward to a very fruitful and long relationship. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mario. I should just say that um, 
Tom has arrived literally off the plane from Queensland this morning, which is a great effort, you know, to close the games, having put it on, and, uh, uh, and then uh, come over to a much better event, by the way, here. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, good to see you, mate. Good to see you, mate. Um, so, uh, Catherine, over, over to you, if I may. And thank you all before Karen Sartre for coming for participating. These events are only as good as the people who are at it and those that participate in it. And I see a pretty full room, you know, uh, so you deserve a huge round of applause. In fact, give yourselves a round of applause, because it might wake you up. <laughs> Catherine, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, for that uh, introduction. And just before he disappears, I'd just like to say on behalf of the City of London Corporation how very grateful we've been to the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council for working uh, with us, <coughs> their role in organising this forum, and how absolutely delighted we have been to have hosted the Commonwealth Business Forum here. So it's my sort of pleasant uh, duty to introduce our last uh, um, uh, two speakers, and I'd like to start by introducing the, uh, the Honourable Cameron Dick, the Minister for State Development, Manufacturing, Infrastructure and Planning from Queensland, Australia, for a few remarks. Thank you. Cameron. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Uh, and friends, it's great to be in London with the Mayor of the Gold Coast, thanks, uh, Tom Tate, and uh, delighted to bring with me the well wishes of five million Queenslanders uh, still on the high after witnessing not just the biggest sporting event, but the biggest event our state uh, has ever held. We are tremendously proud as a state of the success of the Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games. And as a minister in the state government, can I say I'm also a little bit relieved uh, that the games went off uh, without a hitch. Can I thank uh, Lord Marlin and the Commonwealth uh, Enterprise and Investment Council uh, for inviting our Premier, Anastasia Palaszczuk, to speak at this event, uh, and uh, I'm proud to represent her at the forum. Uh, I, I know the Mayor will talk a little bit uh, later about the impact the Gold Coast Games had on his city, but I wanted to put the Games in context uh, for our state of Queensland. To give you an idea of the size of Queensland and how we tried to leverage the Games for the benefit of our entire state, uh, if Queensland was an independent country, it would be the 18th largest country in the world by geography. It is uh, about seven times the size of Great Britain, or as we modestly like to tell our friends in the United States, two and a half times the size of Texas. Uh, if you were to uh, drive uh, equivalent distance uh, from the tip of Cape York, right at the north of Queensland to our border, with New South Wales, if you were to drive that equivalent distance, it would be getting into a motor vehicle outside the Guildhall and driving to Moscow and then a further 200 kilometres. So that was the challenge for our government. How could we leverage that game, those games, uh, not just for the Gold Coast in the bottom, very bottom uh, of our state, the bottom southeast of our state, how did we leverage the games to benefit our entire state? So along with promoting competition, sporting competition itself, world-class infrastructure, much of which was built by my department, we swung into action to promote trade and investment, tourism, the arts, education and the environment, the environmental opportunities, all of those opportunities that came from rubbing shoulders with 71 nations and territories of the Commonwealth. Uh, Mayor Tate and the Queensland Government devised a plan to ensure the 6,600 athletes uh, and officials uh, and the 672,000 visitors who spent around $320 million in our state. Uh, we put a plan together to ensure uh, they left happy and spellbound by the beauty uh, of Queensland. We developed a range of programs to run alongside the Games to showcase different aspects of our state. For example, Festival 2018 was the largest arts and cultural event ever held in Queensland with 3,000 performers. Uh, as part of that festival, we hosted the Women of the World or WOW conference, the first time that's, uh, when, since it started in London in 2010, the first time it's been held in conjunction with a Commonwealth Games. 
and the Gold Coast was uh, the first international multi-sport event that uh, delivered equal medals for men and for women, for male and female competitors. Uh, what we regard as a, a defining moment in gender equality in sport. Uh, we also set a new record by completely incorporating para-sport events into the program uh, of the Games, including the largest para-sport uh, events program in the history of the Commonwealth Games, and we're very proud about that. Those athletes uh, inspired our community and the Commonwealth as much as any other uh, athlete in the Commonwealth Games. And we were so delighted that the flag bearer for the closing ceremony was our world champion, the greatest wheelchair athlete our nation's ever produced, Kurt Fernley. Uh, we also conducted Trade 2018, which was an unprecedented trade event to accompany the Commonwealth Games. We brought people together from around the Commonwealth and, and, and around the world, can I add, to discuss trade, tourism and investment opportunities. We also conducted Trade 2018 events alongside the Queen's Baton Relay, the 388-day relay from London through the Commonwealth to the Gold Coast, and we held those events in conjunction with the Baton Relay. During the Games, we staged 30 forums and business matching and networking sessions, and we were pleased to invite 65 investors and SMEs from the United Kingdom to participate in Trade 2018. We think that's an historic change in how the Commonwealth Games will be conducted in the future to maximise the Games' economic potential. We believe it's a model for future events, highlighting the value of the Commonwealth institution as a vehicle for more than just sport. And that value has a dollar figure, as you will have all recognised from the forum this week. One trillion US dollars, the predicted value of intra-Commonwealth trade by 2020. So building partnerships within the Commonwealth during a time that unites the Commonwealth makes good economic sense. The Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games have now entered uh, Commonwealth Games history, but for Queenslanders uh, there is a living legacy. We now have world-class infrastructure in place, including the Gold Coast Health and Knowledge Precinct, for which I'm responsible as the Minister for Economic Development in Queensland. Uh, that is a co-located facility where the Games Village is, but that will be converted uh, with a world-class a university, Griffith University, and our Gold Coast University Hospital into a health and knowledge precinct to attract industry and investment uh, for the development of knowledge-based industries. And before I came uh, to uh, London, uh, we announced an $80 million investment by uh, the Griffith University into a new centre for 3D printing, uh, which will revolutionise manufacturing in the future. So uh, we welcome your interest uh, to the Gold Coast Health and Knowledge Precinct, your companies and your uh, state or territorial interests, uh, you are welcome to join us at the Health and Knowledge Precinct. So the legacy of the Games extends beyond the city in which they're held. Those who say the Commonwealth is anachronistic, that its relevance has passed, fail to understand, I think, its contemporary function. The Commonwealth provides us with a thread that binds its member nations to a unify, unifying set of ideals anchored to a shared set of values. In a world where the democratic project is frankly in retreat in a number of countries, the Commonwealth provides an institutional fortress for the values that bind us, freedom, the rule of law and democracy, and the way of life that those principles support. That's the real legacy for us uh, and for Australians for the Commonwealth Games. They provide us with a point of contact, a place to gather and compete, to share and to connect to strive and to celebrate, and to celebrate. And they fortify our commitment uh, to the liberal values that we all share and reinforce our commitment to common goals and our connection to one another. This year's Games theme of humanity, equality, destiny remind us of how those terms are connected, that our destiny is linked to our humanity and to our pursuit of equality, and that our prospects for the future are founded upon the relationships we carry forward from the past. So we're very proud of the Commonwealth Games. Uh, we believe it was a great success for our state, uh, for the city of the Gold Coast, for our state, for our nation and for the Commonwealth. Or if you put it another way, it's game on Birmingham 2022. So uh, 
on behalf of the Queensland Government, thank you again for the opportunity to address you. And I and uh, uh, Mayor Tate look forward to inviting you and seeing you at the Gold Coast sometime in the near future. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for that and how fitting that we are holding this, um, this very successful Commonwealth Business Summit straight after that very successful set of games. And with that in mind, straight off the plane, uh, Mayor Tom Tate from Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia to speak to us. Thank you. Tom. Ministers, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, it's been quite a journey since we were awarded the Commonwealth Games and in those seven years there was one thing that uh, was on our agenda. I'll go straight to the point. Yes, we want to deliver the friendliest game and a lot of firsts that Minister Dick was mentioning and as well as mop up as much money as I could from the federal and state government <laughs> and build the infrastructure. And of course, we had to have a skin in the game and put some of our money in as well. So all three tiers of government was able to build various infrastructure for our city. And this infrastructure includes light rail, roads, upgrade, sporting uh, stadiums and the like. But you know, what I say to everyone that visit the Gold Coast or for the games, it's not what you see on the infrastructure, it's what you feel. The feeling that our volunteers would generate, how friendly the city of the Gold Coast and Queenslanders are, their generosity at heart, smiles upon smiles of faces throughout the games, and the opportunity to encourage all the athletes to do their personal best. And yes, there were record, um, games record and world's record broken. But for them to take away memories of the Gold Coast, to think Gold Coasters and Queenslanders, they were friendly. And what I say to all of them, be like a boomerang. You know, with a boomerang, as you throw it, it returns back. Well, I said to all the athletes and visitors, at the final speech to say, go ahead, be like a boomerang and come back to us and revisit us. And that is the essence of the friendly game. And that essence goes through with the Trade 2018 where we partner with the state government to create the Commonwealth House right on the foreshore, right on the beach, so that it offer the atmosphere for any countries. We act as a conduit so that, for instance, the government representative from Canada can meet the representatives from India and go ahead and come up with some trade initiatives and they can go ahead with it. And I found some of those came back to say, we are doing some deals, of course, with commercial interests at heart. They can't be explicit, but I do smile quite a bit because the way I look at it, one thing about Gold Coast and Australians we have that have a go spirit, and somewhere or another, we'll clip a commission along the way. And that is the spirit of the Commonwealth of trading. You see, you can't really start trading unless you have the feel good of friendship and the Commonwealth spirit. You don't trade with somebody you're not, you're not, you don't like or not aware of. You trade with someone with a long-term view that has similar values and that has that spirit of going, of fairness. And that's what this Commonwealth Games is all about. So we capitalise on that, that we all came together, 70 con 71 countries and territories, right through the journey, from the Queen's Baton Relay being launched by Her Majesty the Queen at Buckingham Palace, giving it to Anna Mears, our legendary cyclist, beaming a smile across London, and then travelling across various countries, I think over 50 countries throughout. And each time that we had the opportunity to celebrate the Queen's baton relay, we had a trade team right there carrying on the baton, whether it's Canada, India, 
Singapore, Malaysia, the list goes on, to encourage the, um, the friendship. From friendship come confidence. From confidence come investment. From investment come future jobs for the future generation. And as leaders of our cities and countries, it's about the opportunity of creating jobs for the next generation so that they, they can live and work at the place where they live. And what happens when they do that? As they grow up, I know on a Sunday afternoon, my eldest son will come over with the grandson and he'll go straight to my fridge and have a drink of my cold beer. But that's all right, because I get the chance to cuddle up to the grandkids. And later in the afternoon, when the baby has soiled himself, I'm going to smile back to David and say, good on you, mate, you can have that back. <laughs> and that is the essence, the underlying part, why we want job for, for our kids to have a choice to live in the city they brought up, so that the family unit can be tighter. And this day and age, I want our families to be closer together. And really, that's the message and that's what should drive us through the Commonwealth to trade among each other. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. So from friendship to confidence to investment to jobs and opportunities, that may have been what you were achieving through the Games and absolutely what we've been achieving through this business uh, uh, forum. So we've been really delighted again to be hosting this and to have hosted the banquet uh, yesterday evening where the President of South Africa, under that awning over there, <clears throat> gave an excellent speech where he spoke of his ambitions to build a new and inclusive growth path for South Africa and to support regeneration across the whole continent. And he highlighted the role of the Commonwealth uh, together in addressing shared challenges in education and infrastructure. And our own Chancellor spoke on the importance of boosting intra-Commonwealth trade, spreading inclusive growth, and how we can build upon that Commonwealth advantage that already exists in the trade and links uh, between us. The last few days have really brought home to me, I already knew, but they have really brought home to me what a special organisation the Commonwealth is and how one of its great strengths is its diversity, which creates uh, economic opportunities. On the one hand, we have shared values and cultures which enable understanding and the exchange of ideas and give us practical advantages such as uh, um, quite often similar legal frameworks, uh, mutual recognition of regulations and qualifications. So on the one hand, we share all that and on the other, the diversity of our different economies, our geography and stages of development give us, if we use it well, a shared resilience and the opportunity for trade between very different economies who can support each other. As the Commonwealth's primary international financial centre, there are huge opportunities uh, for the City of London to facilitate these relationships to facilitate trade and investment and other links. To work with Commonwealth partners to help harness the power of international financial markets to tackle global challenges such as climate change. And I hope that the expertise and experience which is clustered uh, here in London from our global um, institutions that are based here, so many of which actually depend on Commonwealth uh, links and Commonwealth uh, 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 citizens uh, for their strengths. I hope that that expertise can be shared across the Commonwealth for the mutual benefit of all its members. One thing which the uh, forum has highlighted for me is the need for businesses and governments to collaborate. And I chaired a really fascinating panel this morning on cybersecurity on this very topic. Cybersecurity, surely one of the greatest challenges which we face at the moment. And governments need, need business to be open about the threats. And business needs government to be reactive and nimble to issues. More broadly, business must play its part in reaching the sustainable development goals. 
And we in the Commonwealth need to continue sharing best practice with each other on these and other issues, understanding what works and what doesn't. In an era when some of the big economies are turning back towards protectionism, the Commonwealth can be an organisation to champion free trade and to show how free enterprise can be the engine of global uh, prosperity. If we can use our relationships to increase tr the trade and investment between our nations and therefore increase our prosperity, this is going to be a great success for the Commonwealth in this century. Drawing on that common thread, which the Minister spoke to us about a few minutes ago, building on those common links uh, for the Commonwealth and opportunity of our, our, our many citizens. Now, I think this forum has been a great step towards this. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for staying this long into the uh, proceedings, which have been very um, 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 taxing, I know, and very interesting, but very intense. And thank you, uh, thank you for listening. Let's build on those links. Let's take this uh, further forward. Thank you.